Hello students, today we will uh, discuss on uh, spread spectrum multiple access techniques. We have uh, learnt already the different uh, wireless communication characteristics and we have also learnt about the diversity, we have learnt about the receiver techniques and we have little bit understanding that uh, in a wireless communication domain. Uh, in a spread spectrum supported uh, system, uh, for example, a code division multiple access uh, based systems, we will have multiple users in a network where simultaneously they will try to access and they will try to send their data to the intended users and that is the general nature of any wireless communication networks. Today we will try to see when this multiple users try to access the medium, wireless medium, uh, basically uh, to transmit their independent data and uh, how will it happen and what are the different techniques and the mechanisms are there to support the successful communication between two users over such a network. Uh, we understand that in a spread spectrum communication system, uh, multiple users can access the network, can uh, transmit their data at the same time, at the same frequency and uh, they will be uh, segregated by, uh, by each other, from each other by the use of unique key or unique spread spectrum sequence. Actually, the communication that happens in a network, if you try to see, it may be a point to point, I mean one user targeting another user or it can be a multiple users targeting uh, sending data to a point. A good example of multiple point targeting to a um, user is uh, the multiple users trying to send their data to the base station from your handset, you are trying to transmit to the base station like you multiple such users can uh, try to target their, try to uh, send their data from the mobile handset to the base station. That is a multi point to a point communication. When point to point communication goes on, then it may be a single user directly communicating to another user or it may happen that uh, uh, one base station is communicating with another base station directly. Uh, whatever it is, if it is a point to point communication, then the situation is we sometimes call it a station to station communication also. So, this point to point communication, the main uh, major problem is when you are sending your data to your intended user, how in a receiver you will detect and decode your own intended signal when all others are also transmitting their radio signals and they are uh, giving severe amount of interference to your signal. So, uh, because we understand all the users can simultaneously transmit over the same time and the same frequency, so uh, interference is obvious to happen and uh, the question is how we will uh, detect your own signal, intended signal in presence of the other users who are supposed to be the interference to you. Multi point to point in that situation your target signal your uh, main problem is sitting in the base station in the receiver, how will you detect each and every user signal separately? How will you detect, how will you deco decode the several spectrum signals separately? So, the uh, problem definition is different. In a point to point communication interference is going to play a role to detect your own signal and where you do not have a load to sometimes inter uh, detecting the other interfering signals, you may or you may not also. But in the base station receivers when multi point to point communication is going on, sitting in a base station receiver, your point, uh, your problem statement is to detect and decode each and every user signals in the presence of the other interfering signals. So, we have given an example in the figure 1 and figure 2 as an example of your uh, point to point and uh, uh, multi point to point uh, receivers. See, uh, this figure is basically for point to point. Uh, we have uh, shown that in figure 1, it is a uh, multiple data sources, it stands for the sources. Here is a destination. So, multiple signals once they are coming local data sources, they can be multiplexed and uh, this is a node inside a node, it is a multiplexing going on 
and hence uh, in the transmitter output you are getting uh, one to one communication because destination is fundamentally getting uh, multiplexed signal from multiple source it is a point to point channel. So, in the receiver, uh, so from transmitter to receiver after receiving in the receiver what is happening is receiver is demultiplexing the data to separate the separate out the different uh, source signals and heat can it can target uh, different destination also. So, this is a typical the channel itself is a point to point channel. So, there is no concept of multiple uh, transmitters that are interfering your reception it is not like that. So, this is a multi point, point to point channel and uh, because of this it is basically based on the multiplexing and demultiplexing of the signals uh, to separate out the uh, multiple sources and multiple destinations. Uh, so, this is one kind of the way of handling the multiple access in a over a point to point channel. Uh, next is the multi point to point communication let us see how will it happen. So, uh, the corresponding multi point to point it is we call sometimes it is a distributed multiple access uh, mechanism where your channel will be uh, multiple point channel or multiple access channel where what you will find is uh, there are separate specially separated uh, data sources and each of them are having their independent transmitters all of them will be transmitting and hence the receiver is bound to get the signal not only from the intended transmitter, but also from the other transmitters. And uh, this, uh, this is the central destination if I am targeting it may be a base station and these are all the mobile handsets or the mobile stations that you are carrying. And this is a very typical wireless communication scenario that, uh, uh, that we face in our day to day life. Uh, it may happen uh, in opposite way also suppose uh, it if it is a base station to multiple mobile stations the communication is going on then uh, from the same transmitter single tra base station transmitter it will be broadcasted. So, once it is broadcasted the signal will be received via uh, to the di different receiver via different kind channels. So, the channel of the receiver 1 and receiver 2 and receiver 3 they are not exactly same and that is a downlink channel that we call the channel like this when mobile station to the base station communication is going on we will call it an uplink channel as we have um, discussed earlier also. And uh, this is the downlink channel when the transmission will be going on from the base station to the mobile stations. So, multiple access here also is you see the channel is basically the distributed multiple access we call it that is why the mechanism is and this is a distributed here this is a distributed uh, multiple access channel and this is a distributed broadcast channel you are broadcasting the same data to multiple receivers. So, these are the basically two different types of the access that we face in a wireless communication uh, network and that we will uh, also be facing uh, when the space spectrum communication is going on over that network. So, now mm, it is obvious that if uh, two users or the are, same, uh, are using the same channel same wireless environment over the same frequency at the same time. So, two packets released from such two users they are there is every provision that they will be colliding with each other. So, but this collisions needs to be resolved because otherwise for both the users the packet will be uh, would not be able to detect it in the intended receiver. And uh, one possible solution of that or I should say the one of the possible solutions of this problem is something like this. You have a channel wireless channel it has a maximum capacity and uh, what you can do it the total radio channel capacity uh, is to use a you can actually divide the available whole bandwidth of the channel which is equivalent to the proportional to the capacity and we can utilize the whole bandwidth of the channel we can divide it by multiple uh, sub bands and uh, we can have a frequency division multiple access. So, the users who are will be allotted in the first band and the users who will be allotted in the band number 2 or band number 3 they can never actually collide the packets of these three users can never be colliding with each other. So, like that you can actually divide the available bandwidth over several sub bandwidths and this sub bands we can call them with smaller bandwidths 
and allocate the each smaller bandwidth to each and every user to multiple users who are intended to send their data over the wireless communication channel and thus you can avoid the interference from user 1 to user 2 to user 3 to user n. But remember one thing actually whenever you are dividing the whole available channel into the smaller sub bands. So, basically your, uh, you are uh, not doing good over the anti jamming capacity of this per spectrum communication which fundamentally comes from the fact that you are using a very wide bandwidth where the narrow band jamming signal will be rejected once actually uh, you are receiving uh, you are spreading your transmitter signal over the wide bandwidth compared to the narrower interference. So, if I am reducing and restricting the bandwidth of my spreading definitely if I am uh, dividing the total available band bandwidth by smaller sub bands. So, the bandwidth I will get for spreading over for each and every user who are allocated in this sub band that will be much much less compared to the total bandwidth available and hence the um, its capacity to its capacity to avoid or its capability sorry its capability to avoid the anti jam uh, activities and uh, it, it uh, capacity to prove the anti jam activity for the receiver that will be definitely reduced. So, um, uh, so that is why actually we uh, do not prefer the frequency division multiple access as a preferable or natural choice for the spread spectrum communication systems. Because in spread spectrum communication our fundamental motto of designing is design is a secure communication design where by default you will get by signal by the mode by the means of signal processing you will get a protection against the jamming activities over the uh, over the environment. So, uh, if we are not um, uh, preferring the frequency division multiple access technique as a preferable solution for the spread spectrum communication. So, um, let us uh, go a little bit forward and uh, the next option itself is instead of dividing the available frequency over the bands, so let us uh, let us assign actually each and every user radio with a spread spectrum carrier. I mean you divide the available uh, capacity over the carriers, <coughs> spread spectrum carriers and uh, this is specified by some pseudo random these carriers or the spread spectrum carriers are the the pseudo random uh, which is specified by the pseudo random sequences and hence uh, this is a key not only a key assigned to each and every user it is also assigning the spread spectrum carrier to each and every user who all will be spreading their signal using their independent key or pseudo random sequences and they can actually parallelly start their transmission because all those keys will be designed in a orthogonal fashion so we uh, the the whole mechanism this way we call it a spread spectrum multiple access mechanism. Uh, remember that uh, the key should have some very specific fundamental properties and what are those properties we will see in the next slide. Uh, to avoid actually the multiple user interference, uh, multiple user interference over the network, uh, we, we should uh, be very much um, the aware of the fact this uh, spread spectrum signals with these different keys, uh, the keys should be designed in such a way that all the keys uh, should be statistically independent to each other and they should be orthogonal also in the statistical sense. For example, they actually they should be completely uncorrelated uh, random processes each and every key should be a completely uncorrelated random processes. It means actually their expectation uh, if you do the time cross correlation and that you take the expectation of this uh, time cross correlation values, it should give you perfect 0. And um, these orthogonal signals in fact, uh, in that can be we have understood actually a lot of the ways of generating such orthogonal signals in the last few modules. And uh, these are the signals who, uh, who will be utilized now for the spreading your original signal and um, they can be having all the different uh, lengths based on the data rate requirement giving you the flexibility of uh, varying the data rates inside the network. For example, um, uh, see actually this uh, orthogonal signals when we generate uh, using some same kind of the using can be generated by some kind of the waveforms as the spread spectrum signals. 
but remember that we always uh, actually define their spread signals on and their spreading uh, waveforms by terms of some cheap sequences and uh, as the mm, uh, orthogonal signals and uh, the relation of the cheap sequences fundamentally after spreading the signal with these cheap sequences remember that you are finally coming up with not in the big domain you are with finally coming up with the cheap domain and the property of the spread uh, spectrum or the property of the spread signal will be governed by the uh, by the property of these uh, orthogonal cheap sequences and uh, these are some known facts to us already uh, we have uh, heard about the frequency hopping MFXK uh, systems and uh, frequency hopping MFXK waveforms. Their hopping sequences we can uh, choose such that during a chip time or, uh, or a hop time, it may be equal to hop time also. So, no two signals uh, should hop over the same uh, hop duration. So, if this is that can be ensured, then definitely you can provide. Uh, the protection against the multiple axis interference. Suppose you have designed two signals in such a way that uh, the hopping pattern for the first signals it, uh, it is something uh, different from the hopping sequence of the next one and uh, such a way that uh, the two within a two chip sequence or within a hopping duration two such hopped signals are never coinciding or never falling with each other near never be overlapping with each other then definitely you can avoid the interference from each other such two users and uh, this phenomena will hold good as long as the chip sequences are time synchronized among all the transmitted radios over the network which is very hard really to uh, maintain in a practical scenario and if we relax little bit the chip synchronization requirements, uh, we can use some chip sequence, chip sequence generation um, in such a way that uh, they will in they won't yield a perfectly zero cross correlation values, but they will mm, generate a very low cross correlation. Then also the system design is possible. And in such a sequence, for example, we have heard about the gold sequence a priori, and Ben sequence is also another sequence who can give us a very very low cross correlation values. So, for FHMFSK waveforms, so the hopping sequences they yield on at least very low uh, time cross correlation values and hence it is actually at least at, uh, we can assure that if two sequence such sequences are given to two different users, they would not provide zero interference to each other, but they will maintain a very low um, interference profile uh, over each other. So, signals with this the same form as the space spectrum signals designed to have a very low time cross correlation, they are basically used to uh, uh, ut they are mostly utilized in the practical system designs and uh, no, we do not prefer to use uh, and we really do not get the flexibility to use um, a perfectly having the perfect statistical property over the multiple codes. So, when we continue the design with a um, with a condition that uh, the codes that are getting used in the space spectrum systems, they are maintaining a low cross co correlation property uh, rather than uh, assuring a zero cross correlation time cross correlation. We then call the system as a code duration multiple axis not the mm, SSMA. So, the distinguishing factor between your CDMA and the SSMA is something like this. In the CDMA system, you can expect that the codes that are getting used, they will profile, they will have a low cross correlation profile. Whereas, in your SSMA, you will have the, will assume that the chip sequences are completely statistically independent with each other and they will be regarded as a uh, random process, independent, identically distributed, and but completely statistically independent random processes. So, this is very much I should say this is very ideal situation and this is the close to the practical situation and uh, uh, so the CDMA signals that we will be coming here, uh, the signals that we will be utilizing here they are defined as those uh, will having a low time cross correlation values as I have already mentioned. And uh, if you see that the CDMA signals, if the CDMA signals are having very, very long period, they will be asymptotically coming close, uh, equal coming close to the SSMA signals, because in that case is the 
low cross correlation values will be so low that it can be approximated as uh, almost 0, which is the case of the SSMA. So, we have learnt about FDMA, then we came to SSMA and uh, CDMA. Now, the time is to go for discuss about the other kind of the multiple axis techniques, which is called the time division multiple axis or the TDMA. What we do in the TDMA is that uh, the total uh, the total capacity the total capacity of the of the channel actually it is uh, over the the whole available bandwidth of the channel is allotted to all the users uh, they can use the same frequency also but the time of their operation is not same so what i can do is uh, now if this is my time axis uh, I what I will do is uh, over the time axis, I will allot the user number 1 some time being, then I will uh, allow the user 2 to access my channel at some other next time being and there like that the time scheduling will be associated with each and every user, where all of them users given actually the time, he will that within that time he has the flexibility to use the full channel, full bandwidth of the channel and the same frequency. So, this is the time division multiple axis where the disjoint slots are exploited and they are assigned to different radio communicator the communicating channels, they are actually given to different users and um, remember unlike the frequency division multiple axis systems, so here the uh, time difference between two users actually ensure that you would not get any interference from, they would not get any interference from each other. Uh, so, just as a single frequency in frequency division multiple access um, system, the it can be used in the TDMA also, but uh, remember one thing in the frequency division multiple access, the center frequencies of the FD sub band used to be different here. Uh, you are not doing that and here similar to the I should say similar to the SSMA and the CDMA close to they are both close to the SSMA and CDMA, but you can nicely club actually the CDMA with the TDMA or you can also club with the FDMA with TDMA or you can also club with the CDMA with FDMA. So, whatever be the way actually depending upon the application scenarios and the kind of the data rate demand and the quality of service the multiple such techniques are actually exploited in the in practice to uh, get the res to get actually the prevention against the interference uh, experienced over a network by the by the users so using this uh, because of this disjoint slots already we have designed already we have discussed that the tdma format and the tdma itself can ensure you the a different uh, in the interference uh, uh, protection and another important thing to remember here. So, as we are having the different time slots, so the pseudo random sequences that we are using for the, the users who are operating in this time slots, the same set of the pseudo random sequences I can allot to other set of the users in some other slot, provided that data transmission of uh, those users who are using this. Uh, set of the uh, pseudo random sequences, their data transmission is over. So, once the data transmission is over, over it as these uh, pseudo random the times are uh, orthogonal to each other, they are uh, disjoint. So, sequence can be repeated over the multiple time slots like this. So, the number of the keys you need now to operate uh, over the over the channel, they are not actually not that number of the sequence, the number of the codes required to operate are really not as high as the CDMA. Uh, so, it is a nice, nice actually uh, so process and a nice situation actually, but uh, definitely the TDMA involves a high delay and the waiting period to get the access of the channel. CDMA is um, not providing you any delay, you can all each and everybody can have an access of the channel almost instantaneously, but remember you have to have a huge set of the orthogonal keys or orthogonal codes uh, to segregate the users and uh, their data. And this is really a very big uh, question, because getting a huge number of the orthogonal codes simultaneously to densify the network mainly is a very big question, it is hard to get or 
so such a big number of the orthogonal code sets uh, for uh, separating the users. The third point uh, was our frequency division multiple access, it has its own limitation. We saw that uh, you cannot get that much protection, uh, that much anti jamming capability as you are reducing the um, transmission bandwidth and which is uh, only a part of the total available bandwidth. So, these are the three different, uh, four different kind of the uh, techniques um, including SSMA. There are four different kind of the techniques and uh, they are having their own kind of the pros and cons and based on the service application, is base, base, uh, based on the data rate requirement and quality of the service, we choose any one of them or a combination of them in the practice to design the network. Uh, another point to uh, uh, make here is if you are using a TDMA system and um, we will discuss here actually with respect to that point. Okay. Suppose uh, that uh, essentially if we have a match filter architecture in the receiver uh, that uh, have the separated uh, coordinators, parallel coordinators that can detect the peak of the different uh, signals with their relative time delays are happening. And if this delay is more than the chip delay T c of uh, with respect to one each other, then what we can do is that all these uh, independent correlation peaks um, uh, uniquely the time varying match filter it can detect. So, what we can do is if I understand that this is the peak of the signal 1 correlated output 1. So, I can follow actually regularly the peak of corresponding to the 1 to actually capture the signal from uh, definite user. Similarly, to get the signal from the user 2, I should already or should always follow the peaks corresponding to the 2 for a regular interval and same for the 3. So, basically if the uh, time division multiple access if the two chips are uh, if the two signals are uh, separated out or they are delayed from each other more than a chip uh, duration. So, they will can be treated as a separate signal and there is basically no interference from one signal to the next signal or always. So, if you are having a chip align where if you are having some alignment within a chip duration only then uh, this kind of the interference, the problem of the interference will come into picture which two users will be transmitting using the same um, the frequency, same code and your uh, uh, same, uh, same frequency, same code and uh, same time. And moreover, we are having some interleaver also into the in the circuit. So, it will also take care of the fact that uh, uh, you get actually a pretty good um, resilience against your uh, interference. So, the different random access schemes are there in practice and Aloha is a, a very, very uh, popular one out of that. And um, it, it does not restrict this Aloha random scheme is such that uh, it has no restriction over the number of the radios and uh, when a radio can transmit kind of. And uh, in this Aloha scheme, the radio transmits at any time and uh, it has a message whenever it has a message and it can listen also the acknowledgement. So, it can transmit whenever it is having a message and it keep, keep on listening whether some acknowledgement is sent from the intended uh, receiving radio, by the intended receiving radio. If uh, no acknowledgement is there, so it will keep on retransmitting his own signal. So, in a random fashion. Then actually a lot of collisions may happen because of everybody will try to send uh, their message in a random fashion. In order to improve the performance, people came up with the slotted Aloha scheme. And in the slotted Aloha scheme, uh, wherever this uh, random transmission is going on, this random transmission is restricted always by the some fixed time slots. And this implies that all radios must maintain that fixed time reference and then you can keep on randomly transmitting your signal and keep on waiting for the, keep on listening for getting the acknowledgement from the intended receiver. Uh, but uh, after that actually the KDSS multiple access these days uh, which is used mostly in these days, they are the most uh, popular and advanced version of this Aloha and the slotted Aloha. They give a much better performance in terms of accessing the wireless channel. 
in carrier sense multiple access e e everywhere which sense that which tells that every receiver or every nodes who is having some data to transmit he first listens the he first listens the channel and uh, try to understand whether some transmission is going on or not in the same frequency and he waits till actually the channel gets free once he senses that there is no transmission at that frequency is going on at that moment only he starts re releasing his own packet and he mm, tries to establish a link over the channel so that's a carrier sense multiple access each and every user obeys this this typical rule of listening before uh, talk it is a listen before talk also uh, the most uh, more complicated and the more complex uh, random access techniques uh, that will will be uh, that can be actually also allowed apart from the csma and uh, that are the utilize for utilization of the channel but remember actually to better utilization means you have to have a better channel state information or side information also to get the information a prior information or access the condition of the channel and uh, that extra information that we use required to uh, give this information about the condition of the channel uh, is not bandwidth efficient communication i should say uh, so that is a call actually how much complicated uh, uh, calls you wish to go ahead with and uh, now this um, collision uh, csma cs ks schemes actually says spectrum signals are generally difficult very difficult to detect so the csma uh, scheme is uh, not that much preferred for the space spectrum slotted aloha requires some time synchronization among different radios that may be done by the gps but uh, that also actually cannot be 100% guaranteed uh, so it is also difficult to achieve so uh, though actually uh, that's why sometimes actually we prefer to go ahead with a though, though we prefer to go ahead with a slotted aloha basically and or some advanced version of the csma for the space spectrum communication and uh, signals and the notations of this non overlapping time slots and all that's not very much useful because we have understood that if actually they are uh, one chip duration away from each other the collision cannot can be actually avoided and uh, so they do don't collide the same space spectrum carriers if they are having a same intervals also if they are having if the time delays are more than the chip duration and uh, with the pure aloha random process also the two space spectrum radio signals can cause a collision at a receiving radio but only if both of them using the same key so you can flat away use uh, aloha and uh, if you are uh, if you are can 100% confirm that the keys are uh, perfectly orthogonal from each other and uh, so otherwise so that's why actually basically in a jamming environment or in a multi user environment we can treat the other users than other user signal than the from the intended signal to be behaving as a just like uh, independent jamming interference jamming interference the space spectrum multiple access now with this uh, direct sequence bpsk waveforms if we try to see and uh, here uh, when a transmitter and the receiver uh, are using the direct sequence bpsk waveforms and uh, you are receiving the signal uh, with an additive white gaussian noise and all other interference multiple users are on so all other interferences here can be modeled as a also as an uh, additive uh, gaussian having a gaussian distribution and uh, the pseudo random sequences are uh, statistically independent uh, to combat the interfering signal i mean to combat the or reduce the effect of the interference and for many cdma systems so their signals are where the signals are not perfectly independent this gaussian approximation also can be justified if the large number of the users are present in a network and we also did uh, assume for this analysis that the radios in the network where the different keys have the statistically independent pseudo random sequences and um, these sequences are modeled as a sequence of independent equiprobable binary random variables and let us consider that we are considering with a low autocorrelation values of those sequences and it's not a ssma system hence it is a cdmm as uh, where actually the it is a cdma system it will be then uh, for the typically for this uh, though the practically most of the situations will be following the cdma system for this situation for this analysis we will consider that the 
condition is following the SSMA or mean the keys are perfectly orthogonal to each other for the ease of the analysis only. And uh, so, the for known fixed times the network key is issued by all the radios and uh, otherwise each radio uses its own unique key for receiving the DSBS BPDA or for receiving the DSBPSK transmission and they can transmit also either using the same key or by the different key that is already provided by the network. The point to point communication system if it is going on where the interference or the jamming signals are coming due to the other users present in the network and suppose uh, we are having the capital L other number of the users on. So, the total um, jamming uh, power the JL that will be varying actually is a summation of the power actually released by the uh, user 1 to user L. So, at the receiver in the question when the intended signal has a power of the S, we can have the effective beat energy to the jammer noise given by this expression. This is a known expression for us this uh, bit energy to the jamming uh, noise power is nothing but the gain divided by j by s, where this p g is equal to the um, processing gain and which will be giving by the number of the chips present within one bit and j is nothing but the summation of the all the other users power. So, summation of all the jails. Remember this analysis is uh, considering that there is a continuous jammer of power j and uh, the additional gains because of the coding channel coding and then the, I mean the code error or uncoded the specific and communications we have not considered that gain will be additive uh, to this processing gain coming into picture. And uh, we know that uh, if gamma is a uh, bit energy to noise ratio that achieves as a desired bit error rate probability then the total interference of this j l should be always less than equal to this. Uh, n by gamma it can be lower bounded by actually it can be lower bounded by the n gamma uh, multiplied by the signal transmitted s. This uh, if the analysis uh, whatever we have done for this uh, point to point SSMA analysis uh, uh, that actually is for CDM analysis and the SSMA analysis. So, for both DSB PSK systems will be having approximately the same way and uh, difference mainly actually will be in the way that you are doing the averaging and uh, generally when the number of the CDMA signals are really very large we understand that it go goes close to the performance of an SSMA signal and uh, so in that situation there will be an averaging going on uh, directly over the fading channels. If I consider there is a relay fading channels this uh, ratio of the bit energy to the noise power will be now given by the average uh, jamming power to the average signal power because you are now considering the you are now considering the fading channels and the multipath uh, the powers that are received over the multiple paths from each and every user. So, now you are taking a mean and or a mean value over that. So, that is not the instantaneous power or the instantaneous values over each path that you are dealing with. Hence, actually the average values of the signal power and average value of the noise power is coming into or interference power is coming into picture in the expression. So, this is about the fundamentals of the different multiple access techniques and a very uh, uh, little uh, discussion about how the error probability or the received signal to noise ratio will uh, or signal to interference ratio rather to say will behave in a multiple access uh, environment in a space spectrum communications.